welcome everybody to um, another uh, episode in the <laughs> series of China Classroom by the Center for Chinese Studies at Rutgers. Um, we have this uh, wonderful opportunity to bring guest speakers and then open to the public so that our students and the speaker and the audience all get to see each other and dialogue. And um, we've, uh, we've really ramped up this program since the um, Zoom revolution under COVID. Um, and we, we've got quite an interesting audience. We don't know where you're all from, but typically we, um, the Center for Chinese Studies sees, uh, you know, people from all over the world, you know, here and there, uh, not a ton of them, but anyway. So um, it's great to see you. And um, I will, I'm Louisa Shine. I uh, teach in anthropology and women's gender and sexuality studies here at Rutgers. Um, and I am doing uh, with uh, Tao Jiang, our director, uh, global programming uh, this year, especially um, with the uh, affordances of Zoom bringing us together. So um, with that, I will um, introduce our guest for today. Uh, Nick Bartlett, who's an assistant professor of contemporary Chinese culture and society at Barnard College uh, at Columbia. Um, he's an anthropologist with training in psychoanalysis, whose research focuses on addiction and recovery, labor, embodiment, historicity, and the transmission of psychodynamic knowledge. Um, his first book, uh, Recovering Histories, Life and Labor After Heroin in Reform Era China, was published by the University of California and Columbia Weatherhead Presses in uh, just October. So it's a brand new book. And I'd like to mention that um, I, it was based on a very difficult um, ethnographic. Uh, Nick is a, is a medical anthropologist. Um, that's meaningful to my students who we just came from a class and we're, we're talking about sort of East-West questions of health, healing, mental health. Um, medical anthropologist who did a very difficult research in a, quite a remote part of southern China uh, with people recovering from heroin addiction. So um, this, is, this is the book that's already come out and he's now moving into a very different field. Um, I'd also like to mention that um, we are co-alums of the Berkeley uh, Anthropology Program. So um, it's, it's fun to um, welcome uh, a member of the next generation from my own alma mater. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Nick Bartlett and he'll tell you what he's gonna cover for today. Great, thanks so much, Louisa. And thank you, Tao, as well for, for having me today. I'm really um, pleased to get to uh, speak to all of you. Um, so let me share my screen again. Um, um, all right. So, um, so today I'm gonna to talk to you, this is the title, but um, I'm gonna to talk to you, uh, try to connect to the readings that uh, I know at, at least uh, many of you did for, for Louise's class and sort of uh, weave in uh, sort of um, weave into, start from my, my first project very briefly, uh, connecting to, to Everett Zhang's work that you read on Viagra, and then speak briefly about the psycho boom in China and connect to Li Zhang's uh, text that I know you also read, and then um, tell you a little bit about my, uh, my current research, which um, is a new project, uh, new not in the sense that it's just starting. I, I've been involved in it in some ways for, for, for a few years, but, um, but I'm just about to turn to writing about it. And so there's, <laughs> there's been um, a lots of experiences, but, but, but I'm working to frame it. And so uh, this is actually one of the first times I'm speaking about it. Um, and I look forward to, um, yeah, to, to, to your thoughts and engagement. Um, okay, so, uh, so Viagra in China, I know that um, many of you have re read this piece on Everett Zhang, and I just quickly wanted to, to come into my own research through, through his interests. And I think in many ways, uh, this is a fun essay, but also his project in general, I really have enjoyed uh, following over the years. And this idea that uh, Viagra doesn't triumph in the way that we might expect after being introduced to China, despite the fact that it is extremely, uh, extremely effective in dealing with erectile dysfunction. And I think he really opens up in a beautiful way the broader ways that uh, history uh, inflects the way that people come to experience their bodies and also what it means to heal. Um, and clearly Viagra, uh, despite being doing the things that it says it does, um, 
isn't completely adequate to the problems that uh, that 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 patients are are looking for help with, and hence uh, TCM is that does not go away, um, and in fact, in many ways, is finding all of these new really interesting uses. So, um, but I draw our attention to um, this sort of. Everett speaking about um, the transformation from post from Maoist socialist, socialist oriented society to a consumer oriented society uh, and change in attitude towards sexuality has been dramatic, partic particularly since the early 1990s. And this is important to me because in many ways we're talking about a similar uh, period over the, I'm, uh, the, reform, uh, the reform era in China, but um, the way in which uh, Viagra for him and heroin for me circulates. Um, I think they're in relationship to the emergence of this consumer society is really important to um, look at in its specificity. Um, and so my first project was looking at, uh, sorry, can you see this top one? Let's go away. Um, not sure why that one. Um, thank you. Um, it my, looks my fine from here. Oh, you can't see it? Okay. I, I've no, just it, no, we can see it. It looks fine. Okay. Uh, it usually disappears, but for some reason it's not. Um, so um, so Return for Society uh, in, in this project is about uh, a middle-aged heroin generation, uh, generation of heroin users who are trying to, uh, who encounter heroin uh, a few years before um, what Zhang refers to as consumer-oriented society emerging. So if for him, Viagra is being introduced in the late 1990s, for me, uh, when I arrived in Guizhou, I came to realize that the key moment for heroin use was the late 80s and early 1990s. And that was incredibly important because the people who I came to know had generally started using the drug at that point and 25, 30 years later are um, sort of their lives are inflected uh, in really important ways by the conditions under which they first encounter the drug. And so the process of addiction, which you know, a lot of people say, well, this is a universal process, is actually uh, intimately um, related to um, the very particular generational struggle of trying to understand what life should look like for them as entrepreneurs who at a certain moment seem to be ahead of society in China and today find themselves um, sort of uh, lagging behind in their own words. And each chapter of the book is a different way that an individual tries to answer the question of what does it mean to return to society? And this isn't a narrow problem of keeping one's body free from an opioid. It's much uh, more sort of existential, but also um, historically particular question of how do I live in relationship to this shifting collective? Um, uh oh, sorry. Slides. There we go. Okay. Um, okay, so there's the, the image from the book, and I'll. I'll uh, this just very briefly. This this figure is a close friend who he's standing uh, uh, in on the site. This is where um, he both uh, made his fortune as a private sector entrepreneur in this tin mining city. So this was in the uh, late 1980s, early 1990s. This was his mining site, um, and it was also the place where. So he became quite wealthy in this spot where he's standing, and also it was where he developed his dependency on heroin. Um, and he and I went back to his mining site and it was the first time he'd been back there in, um, in more than 20 years. Um, so so um, it's sort of thinking about how these uh, processes are, are, are related. And here you can see this is uh, the, the city that was uh, this huge mining boom for many years in the late 80s and 90s. Um, now is this sort of post-industrial economy that can't rely on, re rely on mining in the same way. Um, and this is from the city center. This is the city where I did my field work in Southern Yunnan. You can see it's surrounded by mountains and at night, the mountains are just floating above you. And sort of the way the book explores how you're a the sort of every one of the people who I met imagine their lives in relationship to the mountains as representing something for the future and how they have to revisit that now. It's a way of getting at this question of living return as a historical question. So 
Um, so that was the first project, which I promised not to talk about since it's not the title, but I wanted to give you a brief sense of it. And I do think that it's connected to Everett's project in a lot of, um, in, in a lot of interesting ways. Um, so how did I get from there to the psycho boom? And I just wanted to very briefly, two, two, I guess two events uh, pushed me in this direction. And one was um, a, a relationship with a woman who I had there who was recovering from heroin addiction, who was having these incredibly intense dreams. And she asked me, can you find somebody to help me? I feel, and she wanted, I, she was asking for a therapist uh, effectively. Um, and at the moment, sort of medical attention for these, like I'm struggling, my dreams are haunting me, like like who will listen? And at the time I, I didn't feel comfortable taking that role on myself certainly. And I also couldn't find anybody in Good to, uh, to, um, to listen to her in this way. So, so I guess in some ways that haunted me a little bit um, as, I, as I was leaving the city, um, not having uh, sort of been able to answer her question in a certain way. Um, and then a second one. Oh, Nick, yeah. excuse me. Um, if you're going to do this, uh, we'll just wait. But um, if not, um, can you historicize the so-called psycho boom just a little bit? Uh, uh, I'll do it in a second. Is, oh, OK, yeah. great. OK. Um, and this, so and when did the interaction with the woman happen? This was 2011. OK. Yep. And then a family tragedy right around the same time. Um, a very close friend of mine in Good Joe, who was actually a, a, a mining boss, sort of um, had ma made his money in, in, in the mountains. Um, there was a family tragedy and he, uh, I had just come back to the US and he said, can you find me a Chinese speaking psychoanalyst uh, who can give me the help I need, who's not in China? That was his request. And he had a certain understanding. He'd read about psychoanalysis and was interested in it and decided he needed the best that talk therapy had to offer. And he, this, and so anyway, so I tried to find him a psychoanalyst um, in the US and um, got in touch with the networks that I'm about to talk about in a second. And that really pushed me to seek my own training uh, in part because of contacts with, the, with these um, other groups. So, um, okay. so. And Louisa, here, here's your, the, the, the context I, I think you're hoping for. Um, so, so very briefly speaking about the psycho boom um, before, before moving to, to the translation work. Um, so uh, this, um, this picture I put here because it says, um, it's an advertisement for, this is, this is a counseling center. And it says, uh, so, um, psychological counseling, see results in 60 minutes. Um, and so I think it brings up interesting questions about what exactly is therapy in China? Who's practicing it? And um, how does it, um, yeah, uh, what, what is this field like? A very, in some ways, a, a quite new field. Um, so um, the, um, the psycho boom in China, um, sorry, I'm trying to, okay, there we go. Um, there was a virtual absence of mental health services oops, uh, during Mao, um, during the Maoist period. And here again, in, in connection to Everett's work, if there's sort of Nanke, the men's medicine didn't emerge until the late 1980s, um, sort of to be able to find um, individual one-on-one -on -one therapy uh, in China was, uh, I mean, almost non-existent um, until uh, later in the in in the reform era, where, where there's the where the, where there's this um, a, a huge boom after the Maoist period, and so slowly in the 1980s, I think initially a lot of the influence of Freud and, and psychoanalysis was through the circulation of texts and the beginning of certain uh, training programs. So the Sino-German program is talked about a lot that happens starting in the late 1980s that began to train uh, a generation of um, psychiatrists mainly um, in, um, in psychodynamic techniques. Um, and then um, really a rapid growth, most people chart as, as it being in the last 20 years or so and sort of the explosion of and the psycho boom or psi fever as it's sometimes referred to, it talk shows a discourse in public. So people are using psychological language, um, a huge self-help literature, both translated and also written by Chinese authors. And then the earthquake in 2008, um, sort of another uh, wave of um, sort of saturation in the media with discussion of the importance of therapy. Um, and then online therapy has become something that's in, in the last few years, it's become very popular. Um, so 
I, I don't think I really want to talk, talk about this beyond, too much beyond, the, but beyond saying there's an interesting er, part of the boom was that in the early 2000s, many, many people got certified as um, counselors. And actually, Li Zhang in her book writes about this phenomenon and sort of most of these people don't end up practicing. And the question of what one is able to learn in one of these courses and when and how one becomes a qualified therapist. I think in the early years of the boom, there was an intense anxiety over where and how to train and who was a properly trained therapist. And gradually over time, um, there's been the adoption of new laws, but also just new norms and ways of governing the, the community where I think um, there's a feeling that there's a maturity of different forms of therapy and also a huge increase both in international trainings, but also just in uh, sort of generations of Chinese therapists who are doing their own education and affiliated with university. And so the boom I think is pretty, um, it's well seated now in China that there's a, just an enormous amount of um, of, of uh, therapy happening, um, and um, sort of uh, actually Li Zhang also talks about distinct communities of practitioners, not that unlike the U.S. There's uh, people associated with academia, there's people in hospitals, and then um, sort of society would be the therapists who are out on their own, opening, uh, operating in private practice, and the GRCs, which I'm about to talk to. Uh, talk about um, specifically draw on, on all of these uh, communities of practitioners, as well as um, sort of other people who are who became intrigued by um, sort of trying to understand the unconscious dynamics of groups. So I'll get to that in a second. Um, okay, so Jun uh, Li's Bentu Hua. So, so you, you read this essay, and so I just wanted a quick slide of, of, a, of sort of because she has been quite an import, important influence on me, and she also. Uh, her book just came out um, last summer, um, and it's fantastic and really interesting, and I think offers a great overview of the of the field. And she moves between different modalities. Um, and so Bentu Hua, as I think you probably um, got the gist, the, the, sort of this interesting question of how to make Western originated psychological and psychiatric knowledge and therapeutic models fit. Chinese social norms, cultural values, and desires. And um, I know, Louisa, the, the process, this question of keywords and translation is important. So how we render Bentu Hua, I think, opens up interesting questions. Culturing, localization, indigenization, they sort of, she mentions each of these, but, um, but the, and also the tool, there's this idea of uh, soil, earth, um, rootedness that I think is interesting too. But this process, probably speaking, of making this foreign thing fit. Um, would be a key thing she's interested in. And so in her account, therapists are translators and they're intellectuals. They move between the knowledge and Chinese clients and they uh, find and work with what resonates with uh, the interests and motives of the patients that they're seeing. And so such family therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy and sand play therapy, drawing on Jung, but also with these strong association with, with Chinese images, which interestingly, Jung himself is strongly influenced by China. So these circuits of knowledge are quite interesting and complicated. But so, so each of these are examples of how Chinese therapists are adapting uh, these resources for, for this audience. Um, and I think it raises lots of fascinating questions, which I'll get to in a second. But, but also, I think my, my project and looking at GRCs shifts the question of translation um, and the stakes of these encounters in important ways. Um, so uh, translation and group relations conferences. So um, it's a slightly, <laughs> I realized that this topic is tricky because I need to situate what a group relations conference is before talking about what happens at them because they're in many ways sort of strange spaces to make sense of. Um, and so let me do that for a couple of slides and then I'll get into my, my, my ethnographic material. Um, or, yeah. Um, so they started basically after World War II um, and um, working with groups uh, and these different traditions, which I'll get to in a second, psychoanalysis and cybernetics and systems theory kind of converging. And um, basically in the beginning, primarily were held in England and the US and they tend to be often are residential conferences. So you go live at a place up to two weeks, but usually they're uh, three or four days. Um, and they uh, expand around the world as um, groups pushing to have them in new places. Uh, they slowly went to more, now more than 20 countries in the world have, have hosted these conferences. 
Um, and the, they work by creating temporary institutions. Um, and um, so they, they exist and they create this structure within the time that you're there where there are all these roles and the staff all have bios and then the members have their roles. And then uh, they exist for the time that the people are there and then they disappear until they come back into existence again. Um, and they, they are premised on the idea that groups operate according to frequently irrational behaviors that relate to unconscious group dynamics. And those unconscious group dynamics follow universal rules that people trained in this history are able to spot and diagnose. And so consultants, the non-members who are on the staff, help the members to diagnose what's happening by allowing intense things to happen and then the consultants saying what's happening to the group. So that's the way that consultants intervene. Um, so one of the quotes, the group has a life, a life of its own only as a consequence of the fantasies and projections of its members. And so um, there's heavy uh, sort of push for people to understand how they're operating um, in relationship to um, the group fantasies that are held that can be accessed through the behaviors and the sort of anything that an individual member does can be traced back to the group and how the group is operating in that moment. Um, so within the GRCs, there's two types of event, but broadly speaking, there's here and now events, which you can think of therapy as a here and now event, there's projection, there's, there's transference going on. So this is a giant group here and now events where in the events, they're learning by doing in a sense. Um, and so there's large study group, which is, uh, over 60 people, small study group, which is generally about eight people, eight to 10 people, and large study group is supposed to mimic society, and small study group is supposed to mimic the dynamics of a family. And then intergroup events is uh, actually usually takes place over at least a couple days, and it's where staff and members break into various forms of groups and try to interact with each other, completely unscripted and often very, very messy. Um, so there's the here and now, and then there's the then and there. And the then and there events happen, they're dispersed throughout, but they're basically, uh, if I'm a staff member, I would shift the way I interact with members. And then and there events are, uh, the tone isn't to analyze what's happening in the room at the moment, but to make sense of what happened before and to try to, how do I apply what's been going on? How do I go back into my life? At night, how do I go to sleep when, if disturbing things have happened to me in groups? It's sort of, it, they're trying to, help you digest your experience as a member. Um, they're explicitly not therapeutic, uh, which I think is important. Um, they Initially, there were some questions about this, but it shifted. Um, and they almost always are about leadership and authority. That's in the name of the conference itself. So they're exploring these dynamics by allowing members to experience them. Um, Nick, yes. do you mind, am I, oh yeah, I'm on mute. Do you mind if I interject a? Sure. Uh, expansion or something. So um, in the, the Zhang Li uh, piece about the import of psychotherapy, uh, the point is made that a lot of people, at least in the early stages, you may say this has changed, a lot of people um, in China wouldn't, uh, couldn't imagine a therapy that didn't involve a very authoritative, knowledgeable mm -hmm. counselor type therapist who would give advice that if it was the sort of, and the, so there was a very, uh, a weak uptake of anything non-directive that involved that involved the sort of, you know, the the clients doing the work themselves, which is so big in Western psychotherapy. So I'm wondering, you know, how that interfaced with this? Or is it just two completely different domains, or did you see pushback in the group relations process to that absence? And and now you know, you're saying that leadership and authority are always in there. But clearly not in the form of a you know a group leader who's more wise and knowledgeable and directs people, right? Well, actually, so actually, uh, well, sort of. I'll, 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 I, hopefully, a story can get to that in a little bit because actually, it, it there is a so the way that the 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 way that the conferences work is they there is a director who's in charge who makes all the decision, and in the brochures, every staff member's biography and position is explicitly listed and consultants consistently bring back the presence of the authority into the group. So actually it's quite intentional to make whoever is in charge, um, to make people aware that they are there. And the, the consultants assume 
that the dynamics are always inflected by whoever the director is. And the director for the China conferences, for the ones that I've been to for the first several run by this group, have been uh, a Jewish uh, man in his 60s from Chicago. Um, and so sort of race, ethnicity, gender, um, the sort of language, profession, all of these things, whoever the director is, but all people involved are brought up all the time. And so the fact that he attending these conferences had a beard, looked a little bit like Freud and Marx, were, were brought up by members, people were talking about, so what does this mean? How do you feel that this person is in charge of this conference? So it's very explicitly working with the fact that all groups have leaders and all groups have structure that are either explicit or implicit. Um, so um, so the, uh, the 2014 was the first ever. So there's many directions to go, but just to keep this brief, because I do want to open up to, um, to discussion. Um, I'm focusing on translation. So um, in 2014 was the first ever of these conferences in China that was open call. And um, the staff were mostly foreign speaking, uh, foreign English speaking, and the members were generally Chinese. And um, the sort of Jeffrey Roth and putting together this, um, this conference network with a lot of people, gathered them all together and used this very hierarchical. And I think it generated a lot of feelings about sort of colonial legacies where it's like the people who know this tradition are the foreigners. Um, and so, so, so this is, yeah, which is explored of course in the conference. Um, but here, what I wanna emphasize is um, the language problem um, and Jeffrey, the, the director um, in, in the conferences hated the idea of English language conferences. He refused to do them only. He, they needed to have Chinese as the primary language, but also he hated uh, whisper or other forms of translation, uh, which had been used in other conferences because he said, whoever the translator is has to be part of the system. We can't professionalize it or outsource it. So he wants whoever's doing any translation to be available as a, a part of this conference that you can interact with however you want. And if the translator serves a particular group, they're not, they're, they're not doing that function, he argued. So he created this cultural interpreters that he takes credit for. I don't know if he really created it, but anyway, within the DRC uh, tradition, it's the first time that this cultural interpreters have um, existed. And he, uh, he said they're not translators. They on their own authority decide um, which pieces of information are important to whom, and they summarize the key parts based on their knowledge of Chinese culture and give it to the foreigners. And the foreigners, in interacting with them, uh, or they he would say something like the senior staff, but effectively it was uh, most and not entirely white people from uh, from England, U.S. and Europe. Um, but the um, although actually that's complicated because actually there are also Taiwanese people from Hong Kong, people from diaspora. So actually, even from the beginning, that's not quite true. It's more complicated. And so these categories are quite slippery. Um, but, um, but the translation became part of the conference through these CIs. Um, this is the first conference that I attended in China. I did two in the US first. And I should also say, I was recruited to this through a Google search that the director, Jeffrey, made. And he does this with all sorts of different people. But in China, his networking abilities are amazing. And um, basically, he Googled uh, psychoanalysis, uh, anthropology, and um, addiction, because he's an addiction psychiatrist, and found me and said, would you like to come to our conference? Um, so that was, <laughs> that was how I found this particular tradition, was being uh, interpolated in a very particular way. Um, and um, this conference was bilingual. Um, and you can see the name of it, authority and leadership in groups and organizations, visible and invisible, and this explicit drawing on Taoist and all different tradition, Chinese traditions in the brochure in a way that members had feelings about, but uh, that this was organized by, by Jeffrey with the help of other people in the conference. Um, and then um, in the conference, preparing for a Chinese conference, it was the third ever of these GRCs in mainland China. And uh, instead of having cultural interpreters, Jeffrey decided to have no translation. So there are no cultural interpreters, but also nobody was authorized explicitly to translate. And so I was part of, I was a paying member, meaning that I was one of, uh, there, I guess there are just almost 60 of us, um, most of whom were from mainland China, but also Taiwan, Hong Kong, and then three foreigners, uh, myself and, and a Filipino woman and a guy from uh, the UK. Um, and uh, we didn't share a language. Um, the two other foreigners didn't speak um, 
much, much Chinese and then the consultants couldn't speak. And so in the, the large um, study group, this question of where and how to interact was always active. This is a picture of a small large study group. This is only about 25 people. And it is actually an experimental film that was made from one of them. But this is exactly what it looks like. They arranged chairs in a spiral. So you can't see everybody. You aren't assigned seating. You sit down somewhere, and then people are talking to each other in this very disorienting way. So 60, actually it's 64, because they're also the consultants sitting there, and the consultants sit among you, but they make interpretations to the group about what's happening in the group. That's how it functions. And you have an hour and a half at a time in these incredibly intense um, environments that are often quite, yeah, they're, 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 there's no content. The content is emerges from the people, but the situation that the sort of the rules create uh, leads to um, lots of um, interaction. And so, so now let me get to my, uh, the three moments that I wanted to talk briefly about translation in these spaces. Um, so the first one was fairly early in the conference where uh, a person stood up and introduced him to a spoken, uh, a, Ch a Chinese man, I think probably in his thirties. And then immediately afterwards repeated what he said in English. Um, and one, uh, another member said, out loud, Chinese people should only speak Chinese. Uh, and then there's this fairly intense uh, sort of um, in certain moments of the conference, this knee-jerk reaction that um, to speak English is to betray um, your host and the other people with you in the group who are Chinese and who maybe are less comfortable in English. A second moment that I will again briefly describe. So, so I um, was uh, most of the people who were doing the translating because there was a certain amount of translation that was happening from English to Chinese and Chinese to English because the consultants, two of them were bilingual and two of them only speak English and certain members couldn't understand what the consultants said and nobody was interpreting. So the members had to interpret when other members asked for it. Um, and uh, I don't know, maybe a half hour into the first group, somebody said something in English and nobody interpreted. Um, and I decided to, and I said an interpretation, I said something in Chinese. And um, suddenly uh, a bunch of people in the row, Chinese participants, uh, members started clapping. And then a woman who was Chinese who'd been translating say, said, why are you clapping for him? I've been translating this whole time screw you, um, and it was quite angry. Um, and this quite, so, so immediately questions about race and privilege and who has what expectations around the labor of translation and who is supposed to speak what um, was brought, brought into the room just right there. Um, and then a third moment that I thought was quite powerful. And it, so this happened throughout there. This is the way that the, these things function and the dynamics kept shifting. And there were many, many moments throughout the conference that were about um, of these types of examples. But the third moment I thought was quite powerful happened, I think on the third day. So you have many of these large study group sessions. Um, and uh, a consultant uh, who only spoke English, uh, we as a group had allowed, nobody translated, and it was only in Chinese for, for quite a long time. Um, and um, our conversations. And the, this consultant fell asleep uh, and she was snoring. Um, and Everybody in the room was aware of it. Um, and the reactions to that I, were really fascinating. So one person, as I remember, this is reconstructed, I didn't tape this, but one person basically the theme was, aha, this proves to you, that these people shouldn't, like, what are they doing here? This is, uh, this proves what we already know, which is that like foreigners have this, you know, whatever, like uh, not, not helpful, shouldn't, shouldn't be like, we need to get rid of these people as soon as we can and have a real conference on our own terms. Um, and then somebody else said, um, we did this to her. She came all the way from wherever, wherever she'd come from and we didn't have the capacity to uh, support her, um, her participation. Uh, and so there was a feeling of, of guilt and also of not having extended hospitality. And so, so um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. There's, there's more to be said about all these examples, but hopefully they give you enough of a sense of, of uh, the stakes. Um, so, um, um, I'm gonna skip this because I don't think we need more complexity, but, but also what was happening was dialects, different people's different accents. There was quite a bit of slipping because the large study group makes it harder to understand each other. And so people who uh, spoke Mandarin in different ways, there was tension around who was speaking in a clear sense and this joke, but was also a bit of a 
aggressive statement, I need to translate a Mandarin to Mandarin translate. Um, so th this is also happening during during um, this the, these encounters. Um, and then, okay, so so I want to offer a couple quick ways of interpreting uh, this. What's going on? Um, so GRC has its own way of interpreting. And so Jeffrey Roth, uh, the head of the conference, who um, yeah, especially for this translation piece, I, I, I talk about him quite a bit. I, in other parts, I talk about other, other participants, but because he made these decisions about the language, I was curious in his, um, this is an interview that we did afterwards. And he said, uh, members are hiding behind any number of different defensive structures of which language just happens to be the first one. If you penetrate behind that one, you will find defenses against aggression, competitiveness. It's all right there, right behind the language thing. That's why he put it. Um, and the consultants in the GRCs are saying what I hear to be similar things. Um, translation appears to be dangerous work for us. Language is just another way to authorize and deauthorize members. Translation is being used as a scapegoat for broader questions of leadership and authority. Because at moments people were like, screw this. Like we, why did you set up a conference where you didn't take care of this question? Like this is, and they got quite mad at the organizers. Um, so, um, okay, so um, this, so one move would be to say, what is the dynamics at work and shift away from the language. The language and translation is an entry point into here and now dynamics that can be made sense of through this tradition. Um, but I think that there are a lot of <laughs> sort of thinking with people who have thought about co post-colonial um, use of language. I think there are important um, writings that can complicate this understanding. And specifically by lingering in the unequal encounters among languages as they're lived on the ground um, and how uh, Chinese people come to inhabit particular languages within le legacies of colonial history. Um, and I don't have time to go to Chinese English, so that's another story, but uh, for another time. Um, so uh, two, what I find to be quite evocative ways of thinking about entering into the space of attempting to translate uh, and attempting to speak the other's language. Um, so um, this is, uh, this um, Said Say, cited, uh, his language so familiar and so foreign will always be for me an acquired speech. I have not made or accepted its words. My voice holds them at bay. My soul frets in the shadow of his language. Oh. So there's something about this fundamental um, uh, sort of, uh, the experience of being in the shadow of another's language is something that you 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 can't really ever ever. I'm sorry, that's James Joyce. But, um, and then um, on call centers, this is um, Rachel Howe's work. Uh, she says, "Is not the voice itself de facto an objectified artifactual exterior and surface, not unlike the skin on which is now inscribed an explicit demand left over from an unequal historical relation?" So I certainly am not saying that the Group relations encounters are the same as global calling center, but I think that um, I think that there's interesting resonances in at least certain feelings that certain people are expecting are, are expressing in these encounters. Um, but also the other side, another perspective uh, would be to think about what is enabled by this crossing. Um, and I think that for the translators, uh, and I don't have time to explore all of this, there's quite a bit of uh, of pleasure that happens in people as they cross across, uh, as they speak in the languages that they aren't alone, and uh, sorry, that, that aren't their native tongue, that that enables something. Uh, and I've certainly felt that. And I think other people who uh, I spoke with at the conferences uh, talks about these crossings as allowing something. Um, and so I'm not gonna read the Kristeva, but I think it's important to think about what uh, sort of not just in terms of uh, what is taken from one, but also what is gained by these, uh, by these crossings. And I think part of what the conferences help to bring to the surface is the complicated ways this shifts really dramatically over time um, and relates to, the conferences always want to understand this in terms of collective desire of the group, but I think it's also really important to understand it in terms of the individual desires of people who have their own really complicated histories to, uh, their, both their own native tongue and the tongues that they've learned. And, and I think that that operates in really interesting, complicated ways in the conference and how people come to um, experience themselves across and in these different, um, these different moments of translation. Um, so finally, okay, um, just about stuff. Um, the, and good, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm within time. Um, 
GRC is in Bentuhua. So, so if Zhang Li's Bentuhua is about the individual therapist, who fundamentally, as I understand it, acts sort of as an intellectual. I think that here, the groups arranged into hierarchical roles um, for, produce the conditions under which uh, the group is able to think and make sense of. And it is collective knowledge in the GRCs that uh, about the, the nature of, of translation and group systems as they would have. Uh, as opposed to the West as texts here, the West is actual embodied relationships that are complicated and fraught and lots of fighting, but also like lots of real important connections that um, sustain these conferences. Um, for Zhang Li, um, this, um, the client being really important in, in mediating this. And, um, and I think here, um, while the, in DRCs, they're shaped by however the conference is designed. So each conference is quite different um, and the staff dynamics and who's, who's in the authority positions are really different. Um, and there's gonna be the first ever fully Chinese, but also a Chinese director conference in a few months that I hope to be at, um, but it's changing quite quickly. And so um, the, this question of when and how the language becomes a problem, because there's an aspiration, for example, of being able to hold a, a, a dual language uh, a dual language conference, but organized fully by Chinese organizers. Oh, well, I don't know, this question of fully is complicated, but um, sort of after having held Chinese conferences to come back to a bilingual conference would be a different experience. And maybe the problem of language and translation could be experienced differently. Um, so, and this question of success, in some ways, I think for, for the, in Zhang Li's accounts, it's this question of um, having followers and success for the GRC is really interesting because at one level it's can you throw more conferences but then <laughs> it's also I think different people have really different ideas about what it means and because the whole point of the conference is to explore <laughs> the, uh, the the desire of the group it's constantly there's this arguments about well what are we trying to achieve here um, whose interests and what alliances can we form to make that happen um, so to finish with a couple of questions I guess first for my project and then for you. Um, so one interesting challenge, it's a methods challenge that Louisa had talked about methods. Um, I'm really like a little confused about when and how to move between different literatures because I have to, as an anthropologist, the condition for entering the conference is that I have a role and the roles have shifted. So I've been a, I've been a member, a paying member, and then I've been a co-consultant. So the lowest consultant who is under another person who's teaching me how to be, this was my second Chinese, uh, China-based GRC. And then I was an observer, which is a researcher, but as a part of a collective team where I need to help produce a report that's ultimately working within the GRC interpretive frame. And so when and how to move outside and for what reasons has been a struggle a little bit. Um, and how might conference interactions help us to understand the broader phenomena, including the dynamics of cycle I think that this is, um, and specifically because this is about leadership and authority, tracing these people as they move back to their work and try to apply these techniques in workplaces uh, is something that I'm really curious about. Um, okay, final question for you. I'd be curious to hear any questions you have um, about about, about any of this, um, but as well as stories about stories or associations about navigating the boundaries between language and authority in cross-cultural interlinguistic encounters. Um, all right, thanks. Thank you, Nick. That was extremely rich, and um, I, I'm imagining, although I know something about this work, but I'm imagining. It's quite a, um, a surprising set of revelations for a lot of people. And I think um, one of the things that really jumps out from the pieces you cited that we also worked through with my students is the idea of importing you know, therapeutic modalities or Viagra or whatever um, still encoded for us a notion of, you know, will you bring it in, you bring the form in or the medicine in and then a bunch of Chinese people, you know, practitioners and clients and whatever, uh, encounter it or mm -hmm. administer it. But in your case, it's an ongoing, you know, translingual, international, cross-ethnic interaction. So that there's no point where the therapy gets indigenized and the you know foreigners are left aside. It's always part in the mix. And I think, um, I mean. Maybe you could talk a little bit more uh, about what is the context of group relations conferences and how do they differ from something like the 
you know, more mental health oriented, uh, psych, you know, or problem oriented psychotherapy, you know, who are the constituents? Um, are you able to sort out what kind of people would be in group relations conferences that wouldn't go to these other forms of therapy we've read about? Um, just a little contextualization of what is specific about this in China, like who's behind, who's pushing it, who cares about it, all of those things. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, I think, first of all, it, clearly there's a class element to all of this. And I think that um, while maybe the, the discourse, more broadly speaking, as, associated with Psy fever, fever is traveling, I mean, I think it is important to note that, that it's, this is expensive and it, it's, it's, you know, people living in certain, generally the largest cities who are engaging in this. I mean, to give you a sense, in Guizhou in 2010, when I was there, um, there wasn't that I was able to find um, any uh, therapy available for, for um, by 2020, or, you know, the last few years, there's been um, actually some of the sandbox, uh, the union stuff, like the, the, there's some, there's, there, there are private practitioners now in Guizhou, but it's still, it's, it, it is a tiny, when you're thinking about all of China, this is a tiny sliver of uh, sort of professional urban um, people who are participating. With that said, I think that the conferences draw a really interesting combination of people. Um, the, some of them are psychiatrists, some of them, I'd say the majority are in some sort of a private practice, so they're, they're, they're therapists. Um, also, a, a large contingent of people who do some sort of group, sort of um, uh, group therapy themselves of some form, so that would be a very direct application to their work life. Um, the, the, this guy, Jeffrey Roth, who directs the conferences, does group psychotherapy for people recovering from addiction. That's his job. And he says that these GRCs keep him sharp. There are people in China who have a similar relationship to it. But then there's also really interesting, there, are a lot, there were, a lot, for example, nurses who were asked to go by their work units were, were a, a significant group um, at, at, at a conference. Um, the playwrights, uh, retired CEOs, sort of into self, self, um, self exploration. So, so there's, a, there, there's a real mix. Um, but, but I would say most of the people there have some background in the mental health field. Although that's, they call these us and them dynamics. And they, one of them emerged at the last conference I was at, which suddenly in the large study group, somebody said, like, you damn therapists in your language. And so, you know, right there, like you had a bunch of people who weren't therapists who were saying like, you're so comfortable with this like way of speaking that to us is like not okay and we don't like. And so this is, so yeah, it, it, it's a mix. Great. Um, so uh, we have lots of questions uh, stacking up in the chat and um, I can, I will moderate, I can take, um, people physically raising their hand if the video's on or digitally if they want to put that yellow little hand up. Um, and in the interim, I will sort of uh, cut into some of the uh, questions that are in the chat thread. Um, it, my students, even if you put something down in the chat, um, I would really welcome you turning your video on and asking your question directly. So I see we have one of those already. Uh, Krishna, would you like to um, go first? Sure. Sorry, my camera, I unplugged it a while ago. Uh, I put it in the chat, but I guess my question is regarding the Bentua piece. Um, at the end or near the end, um, the author talks about how some young therapists aren't convinced that a Bentua or localization is the way to best practice psychotherapy. And so instead, they, they believe that the power of psychotherapy comes directly from Western medicine. And so they they may be, I'm reading into it a little bit, they maybe don't want to dilute or, um, you know, mess with something that they believe works. Yeah. Um, and I'm, we could make comments about them or we could talk about them specifically, but I'm wondering, like, will the market respond? Because it says that they're younger therapists, like, will the, the market, will say, for psychotherapy, sort these people out? Or has China changed in such a way that this is more favorable than it used to be. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think that, it, and I, I should say too that I, I, you know, this isn't, it's been, my answer to this is based on my reading to other people and talking a little bit, like not, you know, systematic study by any means. But but my sense is right. that, um, that I think that you're right. I mean, there's been some people who've written about different generations of therapists. And generally what has happened is, 
Um, there's been a real pr proliferation of places that are training therapists, but also opportunities to um, train internationally or over Zoom and Skype. And so, mm -hmm. um, so most of the people who are part of the group relations tr tradition and especially part of the staff, and one tension is to become a member of the staff, it really helped early on if you spoke uh, like English well. And so I think that um, a yeah. lot of those people are, have graduated from online programs or and been abroad to conferences. You know, I mean, one of the key people spent a year in Chicago going to US-based conferences. So there's lots of travel happening and people are doing, actually my mother-in-law, who's a psychoanalyst, um, she supervises uh, a woman in China over, over Zoom. Over Skype. So, so there's been a huge proliferation of training, which means I still have no idea what percentage of all therapists are probably pretty, pretty small are, are out are facing towards sort of the international community of practitioners. Yeah. But, but, but it's much, much more than it was um, even, you know, 15 years ago. And, and also, but I've, I also think that, um, that within China, the training is getting much better. And one tricky thing about training a therapist is um, it's not, you can't learn it from a book. You need to have experiences with patients and then make sense of those with supervisors. And so it's not that easy to scale really experienced therapists. It takes an enormous amount of labor and actually a labor that is um, quite personal. Um, and so I think this is part of what you see when I was talking about, like, I, I think it's quite important to explore how therapists are understanding these traditions, not just as text, because I, I do think that, um, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, one, one example is a, a therapist who, uh, whose office I went to, she had all these pictures of different mentors in her waiting room. Um, and the largest picture was of her analyst who was uh, based in another country. Um, so, so I think that, um, yeah, I think, I think that that. So certainly changing, but maybe only time will tell, right? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'd like to call on uh, Tao Jiang, uh, who sent me a question. He put a message in the, the chat, but it was to private, so nobody else can see it, but it was very early on. Tao, would you like to ask your question? Um. I, I thought he he sort of um, answered it a little bit in, in it's because I, I was uh, I, I was trying to figure out um, why you know if if the point I think if I understood you correctly that this these conferences are not supposed to be therapeutic all right is that, and so then what's 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 the point of of these kind of conferences and I I'm, I'm trying to figure out what it is that they're trying to accomplish. Uh, if it's not really, I mean, to, to generate certain things, I, you know, that I, if, if, if you can elaborate on that, that would be great. Sure. I, well, and in a way, I think that's a question that I'll be better answered. I think it, on, on a surface level, it's easy to answer, but I think that the real answer is trying to get at, you know, the particularities of, of a desire that is complicated. Um, and so I think that, you know, if you look at the marketing brochures, it would say that this is experiential learning and it has different cultures in the UK and in the US. And the US, it was more uh, sort of moved towards uh, universities. Um, and in the UK, it more faces uh, business. Um, and that was because of the histories of the two companies. But so this question of business application is a big part. So you do see um, sort of reference to like, come and learn the skills that will make you a better leader. So that's part of what's attracting people. I don't, I'm not sure that that's the, the main part, especially, and it's also who becomes a member versus who ends up you know, getting stuck and becoming a staff. And, and I think that group uh, at a certain level, it's quite explicit. There are several people who want to become conference directors in China, like that, that that's what, that's why they're doing this. Um, and so there's an ambition that I think is cultivated within the system because it takes a huge amount of labor to put these conferences on. And the U.S. model, you're not really making money. Actually, um, it's not. It's, it's sort of maybe there's a small um, honorarium at the end, but effectively people are doing it because they find it really compelling. Um, there are other there are other organizations that put it on. That it's more of a business, and there are people who are full time employed doing this work and, and setting up conferences. But but th that it's not the model that I'm part of actually. So it's finding people who for whatever reason, find this compelling. And I think part of it is some people really want to make this modality uh, work in China and what that means, there's not agreement on. Um, so, yeah. 
Okay, so uh, if, if I can just follow up a little, what, what, what modality, what, what it is that they're trying to, because it's, okay, um, if the selling point is to make you a better leader, um, which part of the setup of this conference that make you, that can make people a better leader? I mean, because it's uh, the way that it, the, you know, the, the director sets it up, you know, and then it's, it's, um, it's very methodologically conscientious, right? But the, so, I, so I don't, I don't know um, whether, I don't know how that ties into the sort of the objective of, of um, leadership building or whether that's the, you know, one of the objective or other people have other takeaway from the, from, from the conference. I think it's a great, I mean, in part, this is an empirical question that I'm interested in, like trying to talk to more people about why they, especially people who come multiple times, like why they come and, and what, and actually to go to workplaces and see, like, what is it? Because another question is, who's spending money to send them? And, and some people self-fund, but actually other people were quite explicit in saying, I wouldn't be here if I wasn't asked to come by my boss. And so then it becomes, well, what do you imagine this doing for your organization? Um, so I think this is complicated and there isn't a single answer. Um, I do think that the, there's a culture to the group relations tradition, as well as a set of rules that's quite rigid, actually. Like in some ways, it's sort of amazing. Over 60 years, even the way they set up the chairs, and also the, the abstinence. You know, like in in the U.S., the therapeutic culture, like the sort of this idea of abstinent, like um, blank slate analyst who doesn't do anything and looks severe, is pretty rare these days. Actually, um, you know, people tend to be relational. You show the way you're feeling. You're genuine. In these conferences, as a staff member, we're not supposed to talk to members. When we see them in the elevator, we stop talking and just. Um, so it creates conditions intentionally, and so and sometimes some some consultants, when they consult, will stare at the ground or not make eye contact with people. So there are different ways that people are developing modes of engaging that. Uh, are doing this work that is supposed to feed what ultimately I think one answer to your question is well there is a universal set of rules that govern the group unconscious and people want to come because they need to work in groups so they need to understand how groups function and we have found that out so that that's your answer but it, but I think that there's tension around this about including the the truth claim of of <laughs> of the conferences themselves hmm. thank you so um, Kobe has uh, had her hand up for a while. And I, do you have more than what you put in the chat just now? Would you like to? I was going to say, I was also just confused on like, um, like what actually happens like when you go there? Because like, you know what I mean? But, um, but I think, I think it got, I think I, I think my question got answered a little bit, honestly. It's like, it's like, you know, you just learn about how groups work. I don't know. Anyway, but um, my other question was, I feel like um, in the discussion of, of um, like mental health, we often get caught up in like the overhead of like the social aspect and, you know, patrilineal and like the idea of like working from the family unit and like, you know, things that get lost in translation. But like, my question is, what do you think like the legitimate success of the psycho boom and like the GRCs has been in like improving the overall like mental health of like the population in China. Do you think it's successful? Do you think that there needs to be like a change and has there been like some kind of um, like analysis of like what the main problems are? I don't know. Anyway, that was my question. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I, think, I think that's interesting. I mean, um, I, well, to, to the first year part, point of your question, just, just very briefly, I mean, I think that like, an example of how the conference works would be the opening where there's this really intense ceremony where you get your program and you check in and you show up in the room and all the leadership is arranged, seated, like, and you, you're supposed to have like good posture and not like blink or anything and just look out at everybody. And then the conference director will read a statement word for word. And then afterwards they take questions and they only answer certain questions and then other questions that don't fall in the purview of this very narrowly defined, like what's gonna happen, everybody's just silent. Um, and that causes enormous anxiety among the members, especially people who haven't been before. And they'll say like, what is going on here? Like, why did I pay money to come to this? And, then and you know, like I was at one where it's like, well, they're not gonna answer us, let's form our own group. And so they moved their chairs and they formed a circle and they started talking to each other. And, we did, and the, the group on the platform was just sitting there until time and they sort of, 
part of the, the function of the staff is to serve as a container. And so when the, the time for the session was over, they all moved out for the last 20 minutes didn't say anything. So <laughs> this gives you a sense. And then people react to that and they talk to each other and, and it, it, it moves from there. Um, so, uh, but there's no con yeah, there, there isn't any um, content beforehand beyond this very particular uh, sort of mo modal form that, that like basically the schedules are the same everywhere. Um, the question of, of the cycle boom, I mean, is a, is a huge one and I think it's quite complicated. I just say that, you know, there's quite a bit of literature um, from anthropologists exploring at the role of the state and thinking like you know, notions of Foucauldian governmentality and thinking about the particular way that state interests are actually served by promoting um, mental health and sort of the, the turn to a certain form of individualizing and a turn inward is a move away from making collective demands. And so I think a, a few different people um, sort of have explored that aspect of um, so, sort of, and actually in quite different ways, uh, how sort of you, I think some people would initially say, oh, psychoanalysis is uh, radical and would not be liked by um, the Communist Party. But actually, I think that actually uh, the party in, has embraced all sorts of mental health initiatives as part of uh, being healthy, but maybe also for, for political means. Um, and the broader question of what it's doing, I really, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, there's certainly more, it's doing something. It, it, there's, um, yeah. <laughs> and I, I think I think Kobe's question is really profound because in some ways, you know, when it's an intercultural, interlingual phenomenon, we can get so caught up in these meta questions of what's happening, where's the nationalism, where's the import, you know, all these things that uh, the question of, well, is anybody getting better from this, you know, yeah. or is mental health distress actually being addressed in any way through any of these things can get lost, you know, and, and obviously methodologically determining whether people are better would be a huge can of worms, but I really appreciate that Kobe raised it. I just want to remind my students um, that I'm still looking for some of you to um, put something in the chat, even if we don't get to it today. Um, and I'll turn now to Karsten. We would love to know who you are if you're interested in identifying yourself. Yeah. Um, I think people can figure out that you're not um, one of my students. <laughs> okay. I, I'm Karsten Struhl. I teach now at the New School uh, University. Um, and I do a lot of work in comparative philosophy and political philosophy. So, but my, my question really is about thinking of psychoanalysis and psychodynamic models. And the, the, the push for the question is to try to think about whether the cultural assumptions of psychodynamic models resonate uh, with uh, people in China. I, I'm, I'm reminded, I sub, I'll just give one sort of anecdote that sort of exemplifies why I asked the question. Some years ago, I read a book by Joel Covell, uh, uh -huh. who's a psychoanalyst, Marxist, very interested in understanding the social assumptions and social context. And he gives an anecdote. I don't remember where this person was from, but and, as someone who is a immigrant from an Asian country, I can't remember which one, uh, in the United States, needed to see this particular psychoanalyst. And he comes to, and he, he understands, and he has to, he's going to talk about some of his very private things. And he comes with his family. And the psychoanalyst tells him, well, wait a moment, you, the family can't be in here because you're going to be talking about private things. And the man says, well, wait a moment that doesn't make sense. I mean, I don't have any private secrets from my family. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But, and of course, this is some years ago, but that stands out as a way in which the very idea of who is the subject of yeah. psychoanalysis uh, is up for grabs. Yeah. We, in, in Western cultures, the idea of the private individual going and talking about his dreams and so forth uh, makes sense. Uh, does it have the same resonance in China? I'm not just using that as an example. I mean, the whole set of psychodynamic models. So sure. No, I, yeah, I, I think it's a great question. And I think that, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I guess I, I, I have colleagues who, for example, 
have tried to show uh, to explore through, through through literature and through sort of the deep. Uh, actually, I think Zhang Li talks about this a little bit, like sort of working with with particular images. I've made a case for certain for a Lacanian or a Jungian or a, the colleague who is a Kleinian and is arguing within a certain tradition within psychoanalysis can be popular in China for particular reasons. So there are people who come at this question with quite specific ways of working out whether or not this would be um, this would be true and have good reason for it, including including and this is I think relates to Zheng Li's work in an interesting way like and and Louisa mentioned this too like how does one decide the validity of these claims I mean in a sense uh, there's huge popularity of certain mm -hmm. figures and so the, the traditions like uh, satir uh, family therapy would, would be an example of one that's really caught fire and she generally shows this um, and, and um, so so there's certainly something about that modality that seems to be picking up uh, there's, there's a big demand for it. but I think more broadly the question of who's ready for for red sorry I don't like that term because ready implies a telos of uh, you know, and what happens to, to to these different traditions, I think, is is uh, is really complicated. And I would just say that it's quite interesting. Everybody in group relations is always convinced that everybody that these are fundamentally universal questions. And uh, you know, talk about dynamics at a conference. I could just a few days ago, a group relations uh, academic conference, and a person in the audience says, "These are the exact same dynamics in China that we see in every conference everywhere in the world." There you go. Like that's the answer. Um, and another thing that actually we've heard, including by practitioners who've been elsewhere, say China is better at group relations than other places. It's moving faster. There's more potential. Uh, and again, a, a bunch of different reasons for why that might be true. But I, I've noticed that over three years, it's shifted really, people get it in a, in a way. And that's partially the culture shifting because people come and heard about it. So let, let me be specific, if I may. If, so the Virginia Satir would probably resonate well uh, in the Chinese context. Yeah. How do ideas about the individual unconscious, the individual coming in and talking about dreams and there being a dream analysis, which is to unpack the language of the unconscious, how do those kinds of things resonate? Uh, let's say within the context of Chinese therapists or people who see who would be seeing Chinese therapists. Yeah, I mean, I think I just think that that's it's, it's difficult to talk at the level of uh, maybe there's for no example, there's, there, there's a person at, at the institute that I was training at whose grandfather in China translated interpretation of dreams. So he had grown up <laughs> with you know two generations of so so I, I think it's just difficult to say that the people who who I have come into contact with have an incredible sophistication of having read a ton of stuff and been also in a bunch of different, um, often multiple yeah. therapies, multiple analyses even. So, so I know that that's not uh, a representative sample, but certainly certain people are, are um, you know, really uh, critically engaged um, in, and, and absolutely would argue that, you know, interpreting dreams is something that is important and suitable. I mean, traditionally, so, um, the dream interpretation is actually huge in China, you know, right? It's, you know, I mean, a lot of the, uh, it has a lot of significant, you know, um, purchase, you know, in, in terms of the, 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 its, its bearings on the real world and on the, uh, you know, especially when you interpret these, you know, sort of leaders and the, the rulers and the aristocrats mm -hmm. and, and their, their particular dream life. And they, they have, a, you know, they have, they have very, very, you know, huge significance. I mean, not in the therapeutic context, obviously, but then it's, um, mm -hmm. but then they, you know, the, the dreams is, you know, was, understood to, to mean something and they're significant and it's pro it's and it's good to you know it's it's important to understand them properly otherwise there will be all kinds of um sort of bad consequences so i mean so that that you know so that, that there's there's a clear a strong and long tradition I and mean, that's obviously not unique to china so um we are nearing 515 um i know that some of my students may need to um sign off at that point uh, if you haven't put something in the chat, I am keeping track of it, so please do um, enter your question. Um, I would like to see if Matt Sterneski would like to ask his question or have me read it because um, it follows pretty well on this discussion. Uh, Matt, are you there? I, I can ask it. Um, okay. Yeah, so I was talking about um, psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. 
Um, I was just asking if you could elaborate more on the thoughts surrounding like Freudian idea, uh, like ideals, uh, since a lot of the world that's like more culturally conservative um, around things like like sex and you know those types of things that Freud talks about, um, how that's viewed in um, specifically China and how it's changed with the growing importance on like mental health issues. Sure. Um, yeah, I think that that it's it's an interesting question, and again, it's like I guess in some ways it's hard for me to explain to talk about how, for example, how more generally in China, certain trends are going. And I feel like in some ways, like um, there's sort of uh, Judith Farquhar and Appetites has this wonderful chapter where she is reading, um, critically reading and, and thinking quite creatively with um, these, these early sex surveys from the late 1980s and 90s and thinking about the circulation of these surveys and the knowledge that they're producing and how, in asking these questions, they're helping to constitute a, a new sort of subject and sort of, and Everett John would absolutely be thinking about these questions too, because he spent so much time uh, thinking about how desire itself in clinical encounters is being uh, constructed and, and molded by you know, big pharma money, but also by the encounters of clinicians themselves who often um, while having deep compassion and wanting the best for their patients are also promoting very particular understandings of what it means to be healthy that don't always resonate with what he calls bodying forth. Um, so, so I think, um, I think it's, yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'm less sure of, uh, of, I think that sex in general, I mean, I can say from the conferences, sex is talked about actually quite openly, um, <laughs> but this is among a very particular population who's coming to these events. Um, and, um, and I th more broadly, I think in China, you know, if you think about over the last 30 or 40 years, uh, looking at media would be another way of thinking about, you know, what types of images and themes are entering um, public, public discourse. And I think in a lot of ways, um, you know, there's a book called Opening Up that's explicitly about some of these uh, sort of um, the, the norms changing um, sort of 80s, 90s, and then into the new millennium. So. Um, so I, yeah, I do think that they're changing, but I'm not exactly sure how to talk about it as a, uh, at, at say like a national level. Who else? Um, we have quite a few other questions in the chat, but I don't know who's able to stay. Um, you have a couple of generation questions uh, from, uh, from Ben and Jungnan. Uh, would either of you like to ask your question or should I? Uh, let's see, they might have left. Oh, Zhang Nan's still here. Um, so uh, there was interest in which age groups are in these GRCs. And then Zhang Nan said, can you tell us about the actual perspective of Chinese parents? Uh, oops, I just scrolled too far. Uh, but I think it's more in reference to the psychotherapy than the GRCs. Uh, mm -hmm. Chinese parents toward psychotherapy in some areas, there is no universal education. Um, so yeah, so what, like um, it sounds like these are sort of middle age type range. It's uh, actually, and, yeah, yeah, really, it really does range. I mean, it's interesting. It, no, I mean, it splits. It, you know, twenties to seventies. Um, it, it, it because uh, some, including uh, some, some of the attendees are graduate students of the professors who are on staff, uh, and so you have and the question of. That's something that's come up at conferences. Do you want to be here, or you know, who, who, why are you here? Um, and, but then also, um, I'd say that the average age is probably in the, the say 30s through 50s makes up the good majority of people there. But but there's a real range, and sometimes the dynamics of between different groups, but beco that becomes the central thing that people are talking about. And at the last conference I was at, people in their 20s were really the key people who were fighting and doing a lot of the work. And, um, the, and then there were energy, then there were people in their sixties who were kind of, yeah. The, so it became young and old people became sort of a center of, of conversation for quite a while and what the different groups wanted. Um, does anyone else who's here want to ask a question? Mika, Mateo, the rest, uh, Adam. The rest are Ian, the rest are my students. Oh, Carolina, anyone? While you're thinking, I, when you said uh, the younger ones are the ones who are fighting, 
can you say more about fighting? Because I, I, I doubt people know what that's referring to. Yeah, well, so, so in the in the large study group, or and also sometimes small study group, but especially the large study group, I mean, I've heard, people sometimes refer to it as trying to induce a, collect, a group psychosis. Um, and so there are moments when there's incredibly strong feeling created by uh, people who are frustrated. And, you know, just, I mean, like one example would be people getting up and the question of leaving the, not being able to sit anymore in their seat and sort of patrolling outside the chairs and then other people not being able to bear that that person's presence there and kind of literal uh, questions about who's gonna be in what spaces and how they're occupying them. But, but in relation to the twenties, I mean, I think that part of that is the, for example, um, sort of people choosing to talk to other people uh, about certain topics and other people feeling frustrated but not able to switch the topic. So sometimes the arguments are literally over who decides what's important um, and whose voices are heard. Um, but then like certain people will, and this is explicitly part of the theorization, will pair off and they'll talk to each other and they'll have certain often it would be interpreted as kind of having sexual undertones. Um, they'll have, and other people have reaction to their relationship. And so there'll be fights that way. Oh. So did anyone decide they wanted to ask? Um, oh, somebody in Central Europe is apologizing yeah. for not being yeah. active. Thanks for being here. Hi. It's wonderful. It's wonderful to get people from all over. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Mika, Mateo, Mateo, do you want to tell us where you are? Adam, it's you can put it in the chat if you don't want to talk. I'm from Belgium. I, uh, wow. I actually saw Nick on the conference in 2019 with the uh, Yang Jie and Louise. Mm. Uh, That's right. Good to see yeah. you. Uh, <laughs> So it's quite late now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming. <laughs> My pleasure. Well, it was really nice. So. Thanks for being you here. You should. Um, Thank you very Mateo? much. What? I missed so, what you said. I just say thank you very much. And uh, oh, okay. yeah, I'm, I'm in Italy, so it's uh, quite late uh, for me. <laughs> but I mean, I appreciate a lot the presentation. That's great. Yeah. Kind of sampling of. Um, and it looks like somebody's from Hong Kong too. Um, so, um, and Germany, that's great. You got four or five European countries <laughs> and a Hong Kong. And I think a couple of my students are in China. So that's pretty nice world spread. Um, <laughs> so can I, so if, if nobody has a question, I, I, I'd rather have a, have a question. So yeah, since I, you know, I, I you know, actually co-edited a book on, on Freud and China. So this is an area that I, that I'm very interested in, but I'm not really falling on the, on some of the more uh, sort of recent development on this, but it's on, on the question of translation, because, you know, the, the, the topic of your talk is about translating psychology and, and sort of, sort of what, what exactly are the, the Chinese way of translating the, the sort of the, the, the mechan the, the psychotherapeutic or psychoanalytic sort of apparatus um, mm -hmm. into, into, into the Chinese language. And, and if they were really refusing to engage English, at least some of, some of the, the participants that you uh, referenced, um, but then you know, as, as is there is, is is that a matter of simply not understanding certain terminology, or whether that the whole apparatus just you know was not really clicking, or, or whether there's something else at play? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think that um, I think that so on the one hand, there's the translation of all sorts of titles into Chinese, and in fact. I briefly was, uh, I'm a member of the Kappa, which is this Chinese American, um, psycho, this basically a group dedicated to promoting um, psychodynamic work in China. And they had a committee on translation that I was a member of. And it was sort of, my job was to help figure out which books should be translated by polling faculty on, and students. Um, and then there were translators generally in China, graduate students, professors, and they had a press that they had an agreement with that would put out the books. And so the idea was to create a high quality, like that there was quality and control involved because I think a lot of people are frustrated at the translation. And I was part of, I was trying to teach, uh, I think teach is a strong word. I was muddling through having conversations about um, Freud um, that I was um, 
was supposed to be leading that were in Chinese when I was based in the U.S. and um, the, a group in Chengdu, and we would meet for an hour and a half or two and talk about a text, and they would have the Chinese, and I would have the Chinese and the English, and they would have the English, and then some uh, one or two people maybe would have the German, and then there'd be multiple versions of the Chinese text, and people would be talking about which one they should be using. So I think that it's, I mean, it's very slippery, slippery and messy, and and quite, I mean, and and I'm still very much trying to become proficient in being able to have those conversations. I think it's quite hard. And there are a small group within the GRC who are professional level translators um, and their command of the psychoanalytic terminology is really, really impressive. Um, and um, yeah, the, the sort of- Right, I mean, it's, it's a lot of this, that, you know, because it's, I mean, if it's early on, like early 20th century when Freud or the, many of these were first introduced and of course the, the challenge would be very different. So they would have to come up with new terminologies and sort of write them, but then that, that's pretty much taken care of. And now that there, that this seems to be now the, the translation seems to be taking um, place at a different kinds of level. But what you're talking about seems to remind me of what the Chinese do with the, the Buddhist translation, you know, the, the different mm -hmm. kind of tracks that's translated uh, from Sanskrit or Pali into, uh, in, into Chinese over the, over the centuries. And then there, there's so many variations on, the, on that. That seems so the, it's, it's, you know, that, that's the kind of challenge that, that, that we'll see on a, on a really grand scale in terms of in, in importing different cultural uh, sort of object into, into, into China. So, well, yeah, and, but, but, and psychoanalysis is especially, um, you know, acute issue because there is so much specialized vocabulary that's yeah. not even widely understood, you know, in English or German or whatever, unless people are sort of tutored in the, the field. And I'm wondering, Nick, are, are there any examples of uh, uh, words or phrases that, that are argued over in terms of translation? Like, what are the flashpoints uh, where you could have two different Chinese glosses or three or whatever, and, and they have different um, emphases or uh, valences. Can you think of good, any example? It's a good example, but to be honest, I, I haven't, I don't have any, and I think it's in part because the really widely used terms that are repeated all the time, you know, I had already got there by the third conference. And so there've been a few years of within the people who are involved, I think that there's sort of more or less agreement on those terms. Um, I, I, you know, it would be, I, I should track it a little bit more. I mean, I've noticed that, uh, you know, between Taiwanese and mainland participants, sometimes there's differences, um, but, but there haven't been specific arguments that I've noticed about how to render a term. Um, I mean, I'm sure it's happened. I just wasn't present for those conversations. Or also conversations about how the Chinese term smuggles in all sorts of other, you know, connotations or valences or, or whatever, uh, so that you have to kind of qualify it when you use it in Chinese in order to capture the original, that kind of translation discussion. It's an interesting question. I mean, in a way it's quite different from I think some of these other contexts because it isn't, when you gather for the conferences, you're not gathering as scholars or you know, you're gathering as people with like this, that are overridden by the irrational impulses of the group. So I think that, you know, people, if, if somebody's correcting somebody else about a term, often it's in the context of like quite aggressive. I mean, that was my experience of trying to translate and being part of this group of trans, it was very intimidating. I found it intimidating because people would correct you, um, you know, like oh, yeah. correcting yeah. each other, who speaks the best, who, you know, this, and it's very on the surface. Um, and so that, that was, I guess I was more aware of the tone. <laughs> and I think once somebody caught me on, like uh, I had misheard, not the Chinese, the English, <laughs> and somebody corrected me on that. So, so you, I mean, I, I think that that, like it, that was happening quite a bit um, where, where people, this question of who's, and also accents is tricky because we also had people who spoke English with different accents and then Chinese with different accents. <clears throat> and in the context of the, of the conversations in this large group, it's hard to hear. People are talking about different ideas. Somebody said, I only get 80% of English when I'm in an English language as a native English speaker. <clears throat> so I think all that stuff is, um, is, quite, is quite tricky. And I would pay attention <laughs> in going forward in the research to when you're corrected, make notes of that, because those will be the places where there's still some slippage and still some, uh, and maybe not debate, but you know, somebody's trying to establish the authoritative translation still, and you're not conforming. So there's some kind of tension there. 
Um, maybe it has to do what you, whatever, you know, you can see what it reveals. But, I think um, that there's, th th I hadn't been invited in the past, but there's a, uh, there's a course that happens uh, that I'm, I'm doing a part of a session of for the first time that is for more exp experienced practitioners. And that's training people who in China who are interested in GRC. And that often has somebody teaching English and somebody else in Chinese with, and with translators. And so I think that that's happened this is the fourth year i think in that course teaching the theory that's where i, I have a feeling a lot of these conversations happen i just haven't been there mm -hmm. um let me just um boris and avi uh, i just realized it was supposed to be office hours after 5 15. in case you're waiting for me what you should do is sign off and uh sign back in uh so then i'll see you in the waiting room and i'll know that you're waiting for me otherwise you may just be on listening that's fine um, and uh, again, uh, Mika, Mateo, Ian, uh, somebody Chung in Hong Kong, anyone else want to yeah, chime I have in? Just a question. And um, well, I'm, I would like to know, I mean, uh, um, in translation of uh, Freud's and Jung's are based on uh, their, uh, I mean, uh, the original works, so the German, the work written in Germany, in German, or uh, I mean, they are taking the English standard international translation because I mean, uh, yeah, in some many cases, uh, the English version of uh, Jung's, for example, is quite different from the original one. And they usually, and if uh, you translate again in Chinese, uh, you, you create, uh, I mean, um, like a series of uh, errors or uh, misunderstanding. So, yeah. what is the uh, I mean, I'll be honest, I, like I, I'm not I'm not reading much like I'll read the conference brochure in Chinese, but I'm not reading Freud, you know, like I, I'm not the best. There, there are people much better positioned to talk about the quality of the translation. My set, I would guess that there are very good editions at this point and people who are working from the German directly. Most people uh, in context that I've seen have worked from the English. And also, I mean, to be honest, in the trainings that I've been a part of, including Kappa, um, you know, people are struggling with language. I mean, it's really hard. To, it's hard when it's, it's hard in any language. And whenever you have people crossing tongues where nobody, you know, certain people are uncomfortable. If there's a translator, it doesn't quite work. If it's a person speaking directly, then a lot is lost. So I, th I think that in the trainings, especially, you know, Kappa, when they accept students have an English test and then they'll they have a special program of taking another year of English before you enter the program and then the program is in English and you're expected to and quietly I think a lot of people have the translate you know English and Chinese and they're looking at both but at least for Kappa I think that the level of nuance to language that you're talking about there's there's nothing near that I'm sure that there's a tiny you know a smaller group of people who are really um, talking about the term and certain instructors maybe to do that but but what I've been part of doesn't get to that level of um, of detail yeah I see thank you yeah 